السلام عليكم ورحمة الله من البراميل المتفجرة ومصادر الأخبار المنحازة إلى الحرب الدعائية المضللة والهدف بث الذعر العالمي وشحذ الدعم المطلوب للحرب بكل أشكالها على سوريا والشعب السوري كتاب الحرب القذرة على سوريا مع البروفيسور تيم أندرسون الذي يكشف ما خفي من حقائق من الداخل معكم زينب صفار تابعونا لعل الحرب العبثية على سوريا ليست بجديدة تعال تذكر البطل القومي الكوبي هوزي مارتي ذلك الفيلسوف والشاعر الثائر الذي تنبأ لصديق أن واشنطن ستحاول التدخل في النضال الكوبي للاستقلال عن إسبانيا وكتب عام 1889 يقول يريدون إثارة حرب لتكون لديهم الذريعة للتدخل وبسلطتهم لكونهم الوسيط والضامنة سيسيطرون على البلاد وبعد تسع سنوات وخلال حرب الاستقلال الثالثة وقع انفجار في ميناء هافانا دمر البارجة الحربية الأمريكية USS Maine أدى إلى مقتل 258 بحارا أمريكيا وكان كان ذريعة كافية لغزو أمريكي وفي القرن اللاحق الذي تلى تلك الحادثة قامت الولايات المتحدة بالعشرات من محاولات التدخل في أمريكا اللاتينية ويبدو واضحا أن شكل وطريقة الصراع الذي عصف بنيكاراغوا في الثمانينيات من القرن الماضي بين عصابات المرتزقة ومقرها الهندوراس والمدعومة من وكالة الاستخبارات المركزية من جهة والحكومة السندينية وشعب نيكاراغوا من جهة ثانية لا يختلف عن الصراع في سوريا اليوم أكثر من ثلاثين ألف ذهب ضحية ذلك الصراع في نيكاراغوا محكمة العدل الدولية وجدت الولايات المتحدة مذنبة بعدد كبير من الهجمات الإرهابية في تلك الدولة الصغيرة ووجدت المحكمة أن الولايات المتحدة مدينة لنيكاراغوا بتعويض بيد أن واشنطن تجاهلت تلك الأحكام البروفيسور تيم أندرسون كبير المحاضرين في الاقتصاد السياسي في جامعة سيدني أستراليا يتحدث من الداخل عن كتابه الحرب القذرة على سوريا وعن مقاربته الأكاديمية وتوصيفه طبيعة الصراع المندلع منذ خمس سنوات وعن أبرز الروايات والأساطير الغربية المتعلقة بالحرب والمروجة لها والتي يوثقها كتابه ويشرح الدور الذي يؤديه بعض ما يعرف بالمنظمات المعنية بحقوق إنسان ولا سيما الخوذات البيضاء وكيف يفسر العقوبات التي استهدفت القطاع الصحي في سوريا. Professor Tim Anderson, senior lecturer in political economy at the University of Sydney, Australia. Welcome to Minat Dakhil from the Inside, sir. Thank you very much. You're most welcome, sir. Well, your timely and important book, The Dirty War on Syria, put in 13 chapters with a recent uh, edition also in Arabic. It tells about and it describes in details and evidence, which is very important, uh, the war against Syria. Now, the British Australian journalist Philip Knightley pointed out in 2001 that war propaganda typically involves a depressingly predictable pattern of demonizing the enemy leader than demonizing the enemy people through atrocity stories real or imagined how much has the war on Syria relied on this enormously in Western countries to try and prevent any type of protest or solidarity with the people who are under attack and that's quite shocking when you think that we have many more sources of information these days than we did decades mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Now there was a kind of a, a massive disinformation campaign uh, against uh, Syria mm. which was never, it was unprecedented before. I think that's right and um, quite different in character to for example the invasion of Iraq which True. was a very direct brutal type of war mm -hmm. um, and generated a lot of protests in Western societies even though that didn't stop the war at all but nevertheless it, it, it um, it was a mobilization of people's conscience in Western countries. And, and the people were mobilized in Western countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what made the issue in Syria different from the war against Iraq, the war against uh, the occupied territories? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the war on Libya and mm -hmm. then the war on Syria soon after were, in a, in a sense, very 
successful operations in terms of war propaganda because there was something to appeal to across the board to Western societies. The, the centre, the middle, the liberals liked the idea of humanitarian intervention in a, in a colonial sort of sense, saving people from their own systems. Mm -hmm. and from, the dictator, from the dictator, and the dictator must go. Killing his own people, that mm -hmm. idea. Uh, however improbable those stories were, it was a consistent line and um, there were lots of contradictions, of course, immediately if you look closer. The left, for their part, seemed to be, uh, some of them were very happy to buy into the, an idea that there was a popular uprising, a, a revolution against uh, the governments. They did this with Ukraine, remember, as well as with Syria and with Libya. Mm -hmm. And um, the surprising thing with Syria is it's lasted so long, despite the existence of a massive amount of information now. Mm -hmm. Not so easy to find in the English-speaking world at first. It was a bit like a jigsaw puzzle or detective novel to mm -hmm. find the evidence. But after five years... But, but Dr. Anderson, up till now, today, uh, many imagined the Syrian conflict as a kind of a sectarian division, an internal sectarian conflict, mm -hmm. a popular revolt, civil war, mm -hmm. as they termed it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you tend to talk about another type of conflict in Syria. You describe that in your book. Yes, it's a war with proxy armies. Um, mm -hmm. It's a dirty war in the sense that uh, not maybe all wars, all wars are do dirty, but the disinformation, um, the the way in which that has demoralized people and prevented people from raising their voices against their governments. We see in some respects that the Western powers have very undemocratic societies, that when there was a huge protest against the invasion of Iraq, it didn't stop those governments practicing what now the British are starting to admit was a, exactly. was a false war, but really most, people, most of us knew it a very long time ago. Um, so with Syria, it's a case of using proxy armies. This has been done before, of course. It, the Latin Americans understand this very well. I don't have to, I spend time in Latin America, I don't have to make that point to Latin American audiences because they yes. understand it very well. Even other countries over the colonial past. This is what you it. talked about actually in your book in one of the chapters. You said that the dirty wars, uh, they are not something new. Mm -hmm. Whatever is taking place in Syria now has mm -hmm. parallels before in Nicaragua when, you know, the CIA led mercenaries, mm -hmm. uh, Honduras. In mm -hmm. Honduras, they tried to uh, kill and liquidate and mm -hmm. revolt against the Sandinista government and mm -hmm. the people of Nicaragua back in the 1980s. And in fact they were taken to the International Court of Justice and Nicaragua won at that time against mm -hmm. the US and the US ignored the judgment at that time. Mm -hmm. It was openly said that this was US. The people have a short uh, goldfish memory it seems that they forget yeah. actually yeah. what their governments have done. Well every, so many wars in recent times the, the pretext mm -hmm. for the invasion of Afghanistan was false. We know the pretext for the invasion of Iraq was false and that's becoming officially admitted. Even the pretext for the, the NATO bombing of Libya are false and being admitted now in the US, but it's too early mm -hmm. for the powers to do that. I think what they're trying to do really is to pass the blame across to their mercenaries mm -hmm. and to their regional allies, uh, shifting the blame across to their regional allies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tim, very few sensible Western perspectives on Syria emerged after 2011 as critical voices were effectively blacklisted. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to get the information? How did you manage to see what others couldn't or they did not want to see perhaps because of the mainstream media, because of all this propaganda, because of all this mobilization against Syria and the, uh, the government of Syria? Why did you choose to land in Syria to see with your own eyes. Did you come here at the beginning of the conflict or did you rely on certain kind of resources? I relied on sources but I had to really look at a wider range of sources um, to find the information. The information was there from early times. This is the surprising thing that the, the, the Saudis admitted that they armed the insurrection at al Omari Mosque in Dara, for example, in March 2011. Mm -hmm. um, these things became admitted. They were reported. Um, the killing of soldiers was reported in the Western media in early 2011. Mm -hmm. The use of genocidal slogans in Homs was reported in the Western media in April and May in 2011. But the narrative rolled on, in effect, in effect and mm -hmm. people were intimidated um, and felt intimidated, and that includes people who were critical of Western governments, to speak out about mm -hmm. that, to speak out about the contradictions. The corporate media was very controlled, and so even today the war narrative is, um, despite the evidence, um, 
you know, the idea of the, the mythical creature of a moderate rebel in Syria, for example, like a unicorn. People mm -hmm. are looking for the moderate rebel. And even now, John Kerry recently admitted, well, you know, some of these groups are subsets of Jabhat al-Nusra and so on. Exactly. So despite that evidence, the we tend Western not to understand what's the meaning of moderate anymore. Yeah. Who is the moderate and who uh, is the it's extremist? What the it's what the Latin Americans say, el mundo al revés, the world is turned upside down. Mm -hmm. So Wahhabi mercenaries are freedom fighters, you know, and at some stage people become suspicious and want to look for information. And that's really why I wrote my book, not mm -hmm. for a Western audience, because where do they go to find this information? There's been serious wartime censorship across the board in Western corporate media, and mm -hmm. I might add, in academic circles too, effectively, um, there's been a great deal of repression of any sort of dissent on the wartime narrative in academic circles. Mm -hmm. Have you been blacklisted? In the, in the Australian media, yes. Basically, uh, since uh, uh, I travelled to Syria in 2013, uh, photos emerged of the group I was with talking to President Assad in, in Syria. Then they attacked me and then effectively blacklisted me. But I might say that in academic circles, there's been a similar sort of pressure, effectively, mm -hmm. um, refusing to accept papers, um, any uh, mildly positive of Syria or looking at both sides. In England, for example, two major conferences last year. Mm -hmm. This conference in Greece I just visited. Tell us about that conference in well, uh, I was Greece, actually, you know, crossing yeah. the borders. Yes, it's that was about a conference refugees. on the refugee. You uh, were crisis. supposed to be the keynote speaker, but then, you know, something happened. I was invited by one of the organizers because they mm -hmm. thought this is a good idea to link the war to the refugees. You know, mm -hmm. of course, it's a fairly obvious point. Um, the, the Mufti of Syria said to me earlier this year, take this message to them, stop the war, the refugees will stop in one day. It's not an extraordinary link of logic, but what happened was a British group, uh, which is a combination of some, uh, let's say, sectarians and some uh, strange sort of left people in Britain, started lobbying the conference and effectively had me removed as a keynote speaker. But I re-emerged as a normal presenter at the conference and went and delivered my paper uh, a few days ago. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was a lot of pressure to prevent a voice that was seen to be positive or against the, uh, the mm -hmm. attacks on Syria to this day in academic circles as well as in media circles. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, you tend to describe your book, which is a careful academic work, uh, as, a, quote, a defense of Syria. Do people listen actually to your defense of Syria? They do when certain things um, happen in, on the ground in Syria, for example. Mm -hmm. I would say, people say, what influence does a book have? I said, it doesn't really have much influence unless people want to turn and look. They're unhappy with the official story. They want a, an alternative source of information. So I saw a shift, for example, when the Russians took a stronger role in Syria some nine months ago. Mm -hmm. There was a shift earlier this year when the Syrian army liberated Palmyra. Mm -hmm. uh, from Daesh, uh, and then in those, on those occasions when there's a, an impact from those sort of events, uh, when, when Russia exposed the oil traffic from Daesh into Turkey, for example, when those sorts of things happen, people say, this story's not quite right, what can I read to look at, you know, mm -hmm. to find out a different mm -hmm. angle, I don't believe what I'm being told. So on those occasions, I think then it's, it's very useful to have a contemporary history that really provides information that's absent in Mm -hmm. the corporate media. We will continue, uh, but we have to stop now for a short break and then afterwards we're going to detail a bit more about those myths that you described in detail in one of your chapters, but after the break. إذن فاصل قصير ونعود لا تذهب بعيدا. تيم أندرسون كبير المحاضرين في الاقتصاد السياسي في جامعة سيدني أستراليا يسلط الضوء على بعض الأساطير الغربية في الصراع السوري والتي يوثق كتابه العديد منها. I think uh, the main theme. The NATO and the Gulf War. Yeah, the nature of the conflict. Um, well, the way the conflict began, um, there's been uh, effectively an attempt to collapse the idea of the, the political reform process with the Muslim Brotherhood insurrection, effectively. Mm -hmm. They were two separate things. Um, and they still collapsed in, in the Western mind to many extent, the idea of a popular insurrection. So that is an important myth to challenge. The idea that there's a civil war, 
-hmm. that it's uh, basically a civil war and therefore well, this affects the way they look at the immigration, the refugees, doesn't this is a civil war, it's causing some impact on Europe and they're not thinking about the European responsibility for not just Syria but their three main categories of refugees last year were from Afghanistan, Iraq and mm -hmm. Syria. What's the common thread? European countries, NATO countries were uh, involved in all of those, are still involved in all of those conflicts and driving mm -hmm. displaced people and a small percentage of which become refugees in Europe. And so the idea of the civil war, the idea that there was um, a humanitarian crisis in the sense that the government was killing its own people, this mm -hmm. was a constant theme to try and boost um, humanitarian intervention. Mm -hmm. Effectively it failed for different reasons. Um, the idea that there's protective intervention, that the European powers have to be there to fight the extremist groups mm -hmm. because the local uh, governments are unable or unwilling to do that. This mm -hmm. is a, really a second phase of inter intervention logic in the region. Now with the, the, the Syrian army and its allies, uh, mm -hmm. notably Iran and Russia, Hezbollah, um, liberating Palmyra, that myth was was dented seriously in, in, in the Western media. Um, the selectivity of the, the Western um, armed forces in Iraq as well as Syria in terms of attacking Daesh, they mm -hmm. do it when it suits them. Mm -hmm. uh, recently the, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are led by Kurdish forces, complained that they had no air support from the US when they were fighting Daesh, for mm -hmm. example. So those combined sort of myths, and I would say there's a meta myth on top of it, which is that the Western powers have res some responsibility to intervene in the former colonies mm -hmm. to somehow save those people. It's a colonial myth to me, and it's, uh, I say that because it's not really a question of left and right in mm -hmm. Western thinking about this. There is a, a common type of uh, illness or inability to recognise mm -hmm the fundamental principle of international human rights, which is the right of a people to self-determination, mm -hmm. to form their own, so own social systems, their own political systems. True. We have an enormous problem with that. They have been through elections, and this was the result of the election. They want the president, they want this type of governance. So they have there to look There was a greater level of participation in exactly. Syrian elections than in any of the countries opposing them. Not to speak of Saudi Arabia, which is another story altogether, but the level of enthusiasm for the Syrian people to participate in their own system. They don't need a, uh, approval from the Western powers to do this. That's mm -hmm. what international law says. Mm -hmm. But my culture doesn't understand that. So as an educator, I feel a, a concern, mm -hmm. a responsibility that we have to, I have to educate my own culture in that as well. Mm -hmm. And there is also, you, you can sense a, a, a type of hypocrisy, unprecedented when it comes to the issue of Syria, is that they, they talk about the humanitarian issue and the human rights and then they impose those sanctions, you know, that are killing the Syrian people one way or another. And in one of your chapters, uh, which is dedicated to talk about health and sanctions, attacks on Syria's health system linked to the impact of Western economic sanctions, these twin currents have caused great damage to the Syrian public health. So if they are keen on toppling the Syrian regime or the Syrian president or the Syrian government, but they are killing the people. Mm. And they did that in Iraq, of course. And it's not that long ago that it took a long time, but there was concern generated about the, the death of civilians, the, the, the abnormal death of hundreds of thousands of children in Iraq at that time, and as you say, the historical memory seems to disappear. It's not just Syria we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Iran has sanctions. Mm -hmm. Syria has sanctions. And Russia. Le uh, Russia has sanctions. Lebanon has sanctions too. Very okay. serious sanctions across the region. None of those countries have been admitted to the World Trade Organization. There are great breaches of international law in those sanctions. In effect, there are criminal operations against, um, against all of the countries, almost all of the countries of the region that do not fit into the idea of a new Middle East or a Western alliance led by Washington. And uh, I know because I studied this in Latin America where there were sanctions, the Cubans, for example, under the administration of President Obama, there have been almost $4 billion in sanctions by international banks for allowing uh, operations with Iran and with Cuba and with some other countries. So despite the agreement with Iran, despite an apparent rapprochement with Cuba, mm -hmm. there is this type of extortion racket going on with the US saying, not even just to Iran and Cuba, but to European banks, to Australian banks, we're going to find you millions of dollars. If you want to do business with us, you'll pay these fines and we will discipline every other country on this planet.
deals with the countries we have decided to isolate. Mm -hmm. So it's a broader issue there to me that, and in effect, it's in breach with, with international law. In a sense, and the Cubans have documented this, there are criminal elements to the way in which these unilateral sanctions are pursued against uh, governments that uh, the great powers don't want to recognize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, Syria was not to be Libya take two. How is Syria different in this sense? Syria, uh, of course, at tremendous cost, has been able to resist some of the most powerful forces on earth. One, because it had an enormous degree of international of, of national unity, that the mm -hmm. Syrian people backed their army and still back their army. I would say the Syrian army is the most popular entity in Syria today. And they had strong friends, in particular Iran, Russia and Hezbollah, uh, in, and, Hezbollah and or the broader resistance even in Lebanon mm -hmm. and that was always a concern of Washington even back 30 40 years ago when the Soviet Union was a strong ally of mm -hmm. uh, uh, Syria under Hafez al-Assad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, um, to what extent do you believe, Dr. Anderson, that the human rights organizations are, quote, unaccountable fifth state who operate in collusion with the press for the sake of sensational stories rather than an honest searchers for uh, the truth? And why? And to what extent were they instrumental in creating this climate of fear? especially uh, in the West, like uh, the Syria White Helmets, mm -hmm. for example. Well, I would like, I would appreciate if you can tell us your perspective yeah. concerning this. I think this. in brief, we, we see two categories of these groups. Um, uh, one is groups that are specifically created for the Syrian crisis, like the White Helmets, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, contrary to their claims, they're funded by the US, the UK government. They are closely linked to Jabhat al-Nusra, for example. Um, but they were created specifically for the Syrian crisis. There are some older groups which have been co-opted into that sort of propaganda. One of them is Human Rights Watch, which began as Helsinki Watch in the late 1970s to raise human rights concerns about the, the former Soviet Union. Uh, and then we've got Amnesty International, which began as a relatively independent group for in support of political presence in the 1960s. And in more recent times has really been, it's engaged in what other NGOs have called a revolving door with the, the State Department. That is to say, officials from the State Department have come and gone from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. So that's become enormously important in terms of the contemporary war propaganda uh, in recent times. Mm -hmm. Not just that the, the stories are coming from governments, they're reflected in the Western media, then they're reflected in those select uh, human rights NGOs which appear to give some validation to those stories. Mm, and with catchy titles and names. Yes, exactly. And so, mm. and, and unfortunately, as I say, that flows onto academia. I was going through some bookshops in Beirut today mm -hmm. and a lot of those stories written after March 2011 reflect those sorts of themes basically about the war. There, there's a, unfortunately, academia has failed in terms of its courage to speak out during this war. Right, uh, Professor Tim Anderson, Senior Lecturer in Political Economy at the University of Sydney, Australia. Many thanks indeed for joining us. And you'll be joining us also next week to talk about the uh, Lebanese resistance victory back in 2006, 10 years to remember this, and to talk about the Israeli fiascos back then. You're most welcome, uh, Dr. Tim. If the meeting is held in the next week, we'll remember the resistance in Lebanon in 2006 and the Israeli attacks. For more information, we want to reach you at the inside at the media.net and on our Facebook page. From all the media, from all the media. Peace be upon you and peace be upon you.